Uh, yeah, welcome to a uh, diversity panel. Um, we're, we're going to be uh, talking with three people locally and uh, one person remote, uh, and they will be introducing themselves in a moment. Really quickly before that, I would like to say, while people are looking, uh, I think I'm going to do an LGBTQ open space tomorrow, maybe sometime right before lunch, so watch the board. I'll put it up there, okay? So that's just a quick sort of slightly diversity-related uh, uh, commercial. But now, what we would like to do is actually go and, and have our introductions from the people that, that are going to be speaking about diversity. Uh, for, for those of you who are watching in, in the audience, um, they've been asked to briefly introduce themselves and say a little bit about what they think diversity means for them. So uh, let's actually start with our remote guest. Uh, so go ahead. Hi, everybody, and um, yeah, so uh, greetings to uh, Dublin. I'm tuning in from Hamburg, Germany, and I was supposed to be there, but you know, I got, I decided to go for the famous virus um, or infamous. Yeah, so uh, my name is Teresa, Teresa Jovciu. I am uh, part of the Hamburg uh, Python community and Py Ladies. Um, and uh, I've been with uh, working in the diversity and inclusion space of uh, Python community for quite a while now. So I joined um, the PSF uh, Diversity and Inclusion Work Group two years ago, and also um, I'm part of the Code of Conduct Work Group with the PSF, and recently the Diversity, diversity and Inclusion in uh, Scientific compu uh, Computing um, um, committee. So, yeah, that's about me and I'm passing on. Thank you. Now okay. Me. Um, Marlene? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Marlene Mangami and I am a Python developer from Zimbabwe. Um, I am part of diversity and inclusion in terms of the fact that I'm the current chair of the PSF's diversity and inclusion work group. Um, I also, just in general, am really passionate about diversity and inclusion, mainly from the perspective of uh, geogra uh, geographical diversity and inclusion. I'm from, like I mentioned before, I'm from Zimbabwe, and I am the pre previous chair of PyCon Africa um, and an outgoing vice chair of the PSF. So i um, really interested in having Africans and other, you know, not just Africans, but um, uh, Python people from across the world represented and have having a space within the Python community. So, yeah, that's me. Hi, folks. Um, my name is Iqbal Abdullah. I'm a Malaysian by birth, but I reside in Japan, Tokyo for the past over 20 over years. Um, I was uh, the founder and organizer for PyCon Japan and also PyCon Malaysia, and currently I'm helping around managing the regional PyCon APAC, which I hope to pitch to you folks in one of our LTs. We are going to have it in September, uh, but that's going to be for the LTs. Um, in the context of the PSF, in general, I'm currently now affiliated with the DNI work group, which is chaired by Marlene, and also the Trademarks Worth Group, which is co-chaired by David Mertz and also uh, Mark Andre Lemberg. Uh, diversity and inclusion, on a personal point of view, so I cannot speak for my compatriots from the APEC region, but on a personal point of view is actually sharing a common set of values uh, that is beneficial to the community, regardless of where or how you come from or how you look like. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Navanita Roy. I am a data scientist at ACI Worldwide, and I've been residing in Ireland for about the last about five years now. Um, I work with Women in AI Ireland, um, their education lead. I um, try to uh, build programs that, um, that help women and also men and anybody who wants to really uh, skill up in the realm of AI, wants to get a taste of um, how it is like to work with Python and the different tools um, uh, about 
data science, analytics, um, help them out, build programs that support these uh, people. And, uh, and diversity and inclusion really excites me. Um, and really, you know, great to hear all the introductions here. Um, and great to know these people who work in this realm as well. Um, and it, it's important um, to me as well. Um, and it's, and I uh, really don't like to associate it with like different individual work groups, but um, I like to address diversity and inclusion for anybody who feels inferior to step up to whatever, to do whatever they want and basically just be free from all the stereotypes. <clears throat> No, thank you, thank you. I, the first thing we're going to do, since we do have some members of the uh, PSF Diversity and Inclusion Work Group, is just have a little sketch of what that is, uh, because maybe many of you weren't aware that it existed or don't know what it does. So for that, I think we're going to start with Marlene, and then after that, other people will kind of add what they might. Great, thank you. Maybe. Um, so the Diversity and Inclusion Work Group is a group um, that is sort of part of the PSF or coming out of the PSF and the goal is to further the PSF's mission to um, make sure the Python community is as international and as diverse and welcoming as possible. Um, so our goal as the diversity and inclusion work group is just to make sure that continues happening and in a more I would say strategic and intentional way. Um, and, you know, just some background in terms of where this came from is that, um, for those of you who don't know, Python is a very popular programming language, and Python is being used on every single continent in the world. It is being used by over 10 million people globally. But when we look at the leadership of Py Python, uh, whether that is in our core development team or when we look at the board of directors, we don't see the uh, diversity of the users represented in that leadership. And so uh, this kind of, the, the diversity and inclusion work group actually came about when the PSF, which is the nonprofit behind Python, had uh, some elections in, in 2020, actually, in 2020. Uh, a great year for all of us. But, um, in 2020, what happened was uh, several people ran for the board of directors, and in that year, I, I think most of the people that made it onto the board of directors were from North America and, and Europe. And even currently, right now, there are you know, 13, 12, 13 directors on the board of directors for the PSF. And out of those 13, only two of those people are not from Europe or North America. And when you put that in the context of the fact that the, the Python language is being used by over 10 million people across the world, it shows that there's some disparity there and there's you know, a lack of representation. Um, so <laughs> there was in, in 2020, there was some sort of community discussion where a lot of people didn't think that this was, was good um, and, and sort of voiced those concerns. The board got involved in those discussions um, and the community was from different parts of the world was very vocal um, about the thoughts, thinking that that was unfair. And so the diversity and inclusion work group came out as a result of that. And uh, currently, uh, the work group has representatives from every single continent around the world, with the exception of Antarctica. So I have been asking <laughs> if someone is from Antarctica, please reach out to me. But um, yeah, so we want to make sure that we are uh, making the board or the community as representative as welcoming two people from all around the world. And we're starting with geographical representation as our main focus for the work group. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a summary of, of what the diversity and inclusion work group is about. Okay, Any, anyone want to add anything to that? I think Marlene summed it up very well. Teresa, do you have anything you want to say? Okay. Well, and, and I do want to be clear that this, this session is not just about that working group, but we wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background as to that's where um, 
some of our experience uh, comes from. So the first question that we have down for, for people to answer uh, would be, um, what do you see as the biggest challenge to increasing diversity and inclusion in Python communities, and you kind of change, choose the scope. Is it locally, nationally, globally, whatever? So, uh, Iqbal, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Um, the biggest challenge. Uh, so, working on what Marlene just mentioned just now. So, um, unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm using an example by, by, by the PSF again, but uh, it also boils down to that in a way. Uh, the diversity and inclusion work group was started because we wanted to address a problem, whether it's a real or perceived problem from different parts of the world of the lack of representation and diversity in the leadership. And the root cause, from my point of view, is actually uh, the lack of involvement from the community worldwide in choosing that leadership. Um, and this, when we think about it, so I've, I've done some discussions within my own community. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, what's the word for it? The ap apathy. So I don't see how this organization relates to me and how it can better my situation. So I do not get myself involved. And because of that, we do not have the so-called grassroots movements grassroots movement to actually make the change in the diversity itself because people are not getting involved. Um, so, uh, at least in my part of the world, that seems to be uh, one of the hardest things to do because you need to come down to the level, a very low level, where you actually convince people and give them reasons why they need to get involved in the first place and how can it affect uh, your work or your livelihood or your uh, quality of life. So. That's from my perspective. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I'll talk from the Ireland's perspective and from what I've seen in women being involved with women in AI for about two and a half years now. Um, I think in the Python community um, or in the women in AI community, there's very less participation of the local people. I think the most um, percentage of the group has um, participation from different other places. They're immigrants. They're not basically from Ireland. So that's, there's a disparity in the motivation of why do you want to you know, be involved with the community, uh, with any community. Um, so once, um, you know, and there are some people who want to uh, take away maybe, you know, a job or some recognition, and then that's it for them. So when the time comes when you actually give back to the community, there's a, a gap there. So I think that has been a challenge. Retaining that motivation has been a challenge for us. And then growing a sense of, oh, you know, you've got what you've gotten, but now it's a time for you to transfer, motivate, mentor more people to follow your path, really, you know. I think it's, it's been a challenge for us here okay. in, in, you know, from the Irish mm. background. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Teresa. Thank you. So yeah, I think um, this is also happening in, in Germany um, or in Europe. But another issue I think is also that most of everything that we do today is in English. And um, English is not the main language of everybody, right? So, um, and sometimes diversity and inclusion means also tackling um, difficult topics that it's not really easy to tackle in a language that is not your own. So I think um, there's been quite a lot of effort in uh, the Python community to translate uh, some of the documentation. I think Spanish is almost done, and but there's so many other languages that um, have a lot of uh, people. And um, if you think about code of conduct, or if you think about uh, 
yeah, even like documentation of how to like people getting involved and um, like contributing to the ecosystem. This is currently mostly in English, and I think this is still. Um, then it mostly feels foreign for a lot of people. So I think that's actually quite a big of a, that's quite a challenge that is not really obvious to the people when we speak, when our English is quite fine. But right. That is a big challenge in India as well, because I'm from India and, you know, it has got a diversity of languages. So sometimes, you know, you know I understand that problem because not everyone knows or is well spoken in English. And also understanding what somebody else is saying, some concepts are difficult to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And I think many companies are doing a lot um, in bridging that gap. Okay. Yeah, I definitely in line with uh, what was just said, even in terms of language barriers, but I think there's so many, um, I mean, I think the world is divided even like by by opportunities, economic boundaries, things like that. And by virtue of the fact that the creator of the language, you know, is is born in one of, or was, <laughs> lives in, or was born in one of the wealthier parts of the world, then what happens is, you know, that the community around that, or the center of that community is kind of based in those spaces. And I think sometimes the aftermath of that, what it looks like is that, you know, we have a very large uh, growing community, Python community on the continent of Africa, but it is very difficult, for example, for a Python developer to become uh, a, a Python developer in, in Africa um, to become like, for example, a core developer because maybe a lot of, some of the core developers, for example, become core developers by attending the sprints, right? But um, people who's leading the sprints is the core developers themselves and if they're from <laughs> um, North America or Europe then it's unlikely that they'll be at a sprint in Africa and so because of that there's like this bridge that's not there where those opportunities are just not there for many African developers and I don't think it's just those things but like lots of things like Teresa just mentioned the language barrier can be a problem um, but I really think it's, I think a lot of the issues are just, um, just not being connected as a global community um, and having those opportunities or having the center of the language be in um, regions of the world that are not accessible to everyone as well. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Now, of course, that was, those were the challenges. We also wanted to give everyone a chance to talk about uh, a success. So uh, the, the follow-up question is, what, what is a success you can think of? Again, you can choose the scope. And um, uh, yeah, uh, Navanita, why don't you kick off? Um, success in terms of like addressing this challenge is, so one thing that I've been doing is, um, even though if it it's a volunteering organization. I've been, you know, having meetings with these people individually and trying to understand what they really want to achieve and if I can motivate them to, you know, contribute a little bit more. Um, I've also, um, you know, setting those expectations from them um, and basically, you know, making them aware what, you know, they could achieve even, you know, with you know, whatever little they do to help us in, down the line. Um, the other thing is, um, in terms of the language barrier, you know, I have, I myself have been uh, involved in um, translating a few things and wanting, uh, I, I've contributed in a few projects in there um, to translate the concepts in my native language. And someday I would like to write, you know, translate all my blogs in my language and then publish it there because, you know, it's, it's pretty much kind of a remote place. Um, most people understand English, but then there is a huge um, urban and rural gap in India. And so people who, are, who belong to the rural areas, they do not have access 
to the English materials at all. They will not understand it. So it's one of my you know, ambitions sometime later. But yeah, thanks. Um, I, could have, I, I, I could say that. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Um, let, let me break in here. I'm, I'm going rogue. I'm sorry. We were going very orderly. But the question of translation, do any of the, uh, of the others of you have any comments about that process? It's impossible. It's easy. What, what, what do you think of the challenge of translating the documentation, the community stuff into uh, various other languages? Any, any thoughts on that? The key problem here is the terminologies. Number one. Number two, yeah. Python is predominantly written in English. So even though I translate the concepts in my language, you still need to have some knowledge of English in order to write code. So that's another thing. I, these are the two things that comes to my mind. Any other comments? Can I just add on successes? So this also concerns with the translation and how the different languages, uh, how do we actually overcome the barrier? So from my region, uh, specifically East Asia, Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. none of the countries have English as their main language, none. Uh, but as, a very, as something which I'm proud of, um, we've overcome that and we have run um, the regional PyCon APEC uh, for since 2010, uh, for every single year now. And all these different countries, um, communities basically, all these different communities, they have figured out what they think they need for their community and they've organized around that. So we've uh, basically given a free hand to each of the communities to decide what you want to do for your particular conference, even though it's a regional conference, everyone else from uh, the rest of the countries around them will come there. But the whole point is actually uh, we make uh, the regional conference, for example, you have the EuroPython here in Ireland. So in our case, we have the PyCon APEC uh, in Ireland, for, but it is for the Irish. So in this mm -hmm. case, for the Singaporeans or for the Malaysians, for the Japanese, Indonesians, for the Vietnamese. So we can welcome guests, but we do it for us. And in that sense, um, it's an international conference, so you have, for example, three tracks, and two of them will be in English, but there will be one track in the local language. That's what we do. And okay. what is important is that uh, language barrier, what Teresa just mentioned, Marlene just mentioned, Marlene just mentioned a very important thing just now, it's opportunities. So language barriers, mm -hmm. they take away opportunities from our community. People who have the talents mm -hmm. and have the capabilities, but do not have the tools because they don't have access to the tools. So when we have this special track in lang um, language, so local language, it opens up uh, access to role models mm -hmm. where people can come up and ask concepts in a language that they are family with, which allows them to get hooked and climb into our collective bus towards a particular destination for the community. So this is one of, uh, I think, that uh, PyCon APEC, the, the East Asia, Southeast Asia region is very uh, proud of, one of the success I think we can consider. Okay. All right. Any other comments on the language? Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, um, maybe I'll go and then Teresa, you can go after me. But I think it's a complicated issue because, like, even for us to be here, even for the diversity and inclusion work group to communicate amongst ourselves, there has to be a shared language, right? So if I could not speak English, you. I mean, I, you wouldn't be listening to me right now, you wouldn't, unless we had like great translation. And that's something that Python is also involved in right now. Maybe we need more real-time translation. Um, and I feel like, you know, at some point we do need some shared language. And I mean, in Africa, you have a lot of Africans being able, for example, to speak English because we were colonized by the British, so. Um, <laughs> I mean, mo a lot of people can speak English, but I think, so in, in a way, um, English is sort of this bridge language that we, we have to use at the moment. Um, and I think as a stepping stone to get to a place where we are at least on as much equal ground as we can be, I think English is, is fine as a stepping stone, but I do think ideally in the future as we are going on, these opportunities cannot stay in English, like Iqbal says, mm -hmm. 
we need to uh, continue this like uh, you know movement to making sure the language is translated into as many uh, you know Python documentation is translated into as many languages as possible, and that becomes quite difficult because it, I don't know necessarily if like how many people are going to be completely just relying on the Python core documentation, mm -hmm. you know? It's like tutorials and, and things like that. And I think that's also like a community issue as well that our communities, smaller communities as well, need to be translating as well. Yeah. But that's something we've seen quite a lot of progress in recently in terms of the amount of Python documentation or uh, like, uh, central documents um, that have been translated. And I think even as a diversity and inclusion work group, we had a slide um, at PyCon US where we showed the progress in terms mm -hmm. of um, improvement of translation. So I do think it's improving. Um, I think English is a necessary evil for the moment. <laughs> so that is what I will say on that, probably. Yeah, Teresa, please. Yeah, so I think um, and coming back to what Iqbal was mentioning also with the tooling, so the tooling itself sometimes can be a barrier when it's just in English, uh, especially as it's like, it's the tools we use every day. And I remember I was at Pi Cascade um, two years ago and during the springs um, there was a track on translation. And that's how I found out that there's quite a lot of effort and available. It's super easy to get into just translating and providing uh, like translations, which is like sentence level for Jupyter Lab, right? Which is a lot of people are using Jupyter Lab. And I did it because I'm from Romania and I basically, I just did it as I had time back then to do some sentences to translate in Romanian so that the tool is available in Romanian. Um, on one side, it's really easy to, once you have this information, to contribute. But basically, it's not something that I've um, encountered quite often since then, like in your face, hey, look, if you want to contribute to translating these tools, improving this ecosystem, making it more um, inclusive and accessible, how do you do it? Do it here. This, this information is kind of a little bit like um, grapevine and kind of not really like you know, advertised a lot. So I think this is also something that we could do because I think um, a lot of people think that contributing to open source means just writing code, but sometimes there's a lot of stuff happening around the code that would be a lot easier to get into than just writing perfect code to become a contributor, but it's just like even translating is contributing. So I think um, initiatives like this to be to have them a little bit more like better advertised is something that this is also something that we could do and could help quite a lot of people down the line. Okay, uh, thank you. Well, okay. So sorry for for derailing everything. Let Let's get back to to the other. So Teresa, I think you're up next in terms of a, a, a success that that you would like to call attention to. Okay, yeah, well, that was that, right? I think that was a success that was mentioned, and I think uh, the fact that, uh, um, well, Python documentation was translated, I think, last year almost 100% in uh, Spanish, mm -hmm. and uh, Chinese was also not far away. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think another success uh, story that I like whenever I think about diversity and inclusion is the data umbrella um, community. And I think they're doing quite a lot to onboard new people in contributing to open source, you know, running sprints also in Africa, everything is remote and basically really doing a lot of effort into just getting people from, you know, outside the United States contributing to open source and like just getting that little one step, just getting the foot through the door. So yeah, okay. data umbrella community. Okay, thank you. Um, Marlene, what's your success? success. <laughs> um, I think I've really been encouraged by seeing the 
growth in the number of people, for example, that feel confident enough to run for the PSAF board of directors. Like this year, we had more people um, running for the board than like at least since I've been around since than ever than ever I'm I'm sure this is the most amount of people that have run and it was it was very diverse you know so many great candidates um, unfortunately all of the people that got elected onto the board were from North America and Europe <laughs> <laughs> though like there were so many candidates from all across the world I don't know what's going on there. But um, it's, it was still very encouraging to see how many people felt confident mm -hmm. enough to run. Um, I am also encouraged by the number of Python conferences that we're seeing around the world. You know, I've, I've been to so many Python conferences across Africa, and I think that number is increasing, um, even in terms of the number of meetups and things like that. Um, I, I mean, we now have a pike on Middle East and Africa as well. Um, mm. So I feel like that is very encouraging. I mean, pike on China, so many pike ons happening across that region as well. So I think just seeing the community continuing to grow um, and connecting to the PSF is something mm. that is very encouraging to me as well. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you want to? I mean, you mentioned a success with language. Do you have another one? Or? Um, I can't really point to something, but the fact that such a diverse region with different languages, uh, you don't have the same kind of people, even, for example, in Indonesia, for example, you have the Sumatra Islands from Aceh up until down to Australia, even within Indonesia itself, which is the biggest island nation in the world, has many, many different types of people and languages on it. And just getting... Uh, all of us together on a base of on a platform of a base values okay this is what we want for the whole community we want them to enjoy this have access to this equal opportunities for that they can have the tools that they need to do whatever that they want and move on in their careers or in their life and whatever they do we've managed to run that so far without much issues um, having the conferences the meetups to be accessible affordable and making it our own, I think, alone is one of our biggest success. Yeah, excellent. OK, um, we've got a couple more questions here for, for the group. Um, the next one is, what is your, your suggestion, maybe the thing you could do if you could wave a magic wand and just have something happen? What is your take on how to get more people involved, to be that um, in terms of voting, as I think Iqbal mentioned in PSF elections or in your local community. It's kind of however you see that. So um, let's see, I think as we've rotated, Teresa, you're up. Okay. Um, I, would, um, I would get more people to just join as members of the PSF, for example. Um, just small advertisement now. If you're contributing, I think, five hours a month to Python community, that means you're running a meetup. We, everybody knows just running one meetup a month takes more than five hours. Um, so any of this qualifies you for becoming a uh, Python Software Foundation member. Um, and then that gives you the um, so managing member, and then, and then you can just vote, right? So getting more people from everywhere in the world to just join and, you know, you get the news, newsletters and whatnot, and then you see when there's elections and you're basically part of the loop and you can vote next time. So that, that would be something that I would do. Just get everybody using Python to join the PSF members. Okay. Um, Marlene, what do you think? Um, 100%. I think what Teresa said is spot on in terms of getting our regional communities to vote. Um, but I also think, um, as well, getting people from Europe or North America to vote with diversity and inclusion in mind, like keeping in mind those statistics we talked about earlier, hopefully that would make someone think twice before putting down a name that maybe you've seen around Twitter or something like that 
and um, instead maybe be a bit more thoughtful in terms of how for PSF members, how you vote. So I would say a combination of those two things where it is within our regions trying to motivate people to vote, of which that is like a little difficult. We were talking about this actually quite a lot mm -hmm. in terms of how do we encourage people from our regions to understand the importance of voting um, and to kind of motivate them to be able to do that, which I think is, is actually quite difficult to do. Um, but those two things, I think, would be my suggestion. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. Um, so a few, a few things here. Can I just see a show of hands in the audience? Where Are you a PSF member in any form? These will be the people that, who has not raised their hands. These are the, the questions that we'll be asking them. Instead, they will give us the best answers. Why are you not? join in PSF, why are you not a voting member? So number one, uh, it is true. Uh, as part of the DNI work group, we have started a questionnaire to actually first to get to know what our community members look like, how, where are you from, what kind of languages that you, you speak, and uh, why are you aware of the PSF and that you can vote in the PSF. And so far, we have known from this data that around 70% are not members of the PSF or they don't understand that they can actually vote in the PSF and what the board of directors does, in fact. So we know this. And if I have a magic wand, which Naomi hopefully could give me one day. <laughs> well, more than that, I guess if you want. Let's start with one. I'll just wave it and make everyone understand, okay, this is the PSF, this is for you, this is the community, and actually it is up to us to actually take action and make it, shape it the way that we want it to be to reflect the real us, the mm -hmm. 10 million people that is using Python around the world today. So uh, if you will be kind enough to spend just a little bit, five minutes, get down to the PSF booth, and then we have a, a QR code there which you can scan and you can put in your details in the questionnaire, tell us where you're from, what kind of language you speak, and whether you understand what the PSF does. So that is one thing that I would like the audience to do uh, during the conference. Excellent. Lavinia. So uh, I haven't been a part of the PSF. Uh, but you, you can make it for your community or? But yeah, so that's, what, that's where I'm going. So uh, probably there's some gap um, because of which I haven't known before the panel. Um, and now that I knew it, so I wanted to figure out what that is, right? So I went, I registered, I registered myself as a member, I'm probably the newest member there. And uh, maybe after this, I, I will be you know, more involved in there, right? Um, so if, if I had a magic wand, for the same reason, you know, maybe um, I would want to make people aware of all these different initiatives that are going on to involve more people, uh, you know, to take part. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we've got uh, a, one more question that, that we have on our list of things that we wanted to cover, which is, is actually from uh, Iqbal. Uh, and it raises the point that uh, Python Software Foundation is a US-based um, nonprofit and you know, sort of naturally, then the the take that they they have is the U.S. perspective on diversity and, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And one thing I, I have learned in in traveling and in talking to people is that everybody in every different place has a different set of concerns and solutions for diversity and inclusion. So our our question here is particularly based in, in your contrast, this is EuroPython. So for those of you who are in Europe, the two of you, uh, what would you say is, are some differences maybe that you wished were more recognized in the terms of what the European reality is versus the, the, what our default tendency to push the US perspective to the front? Mm. Well, I can I can talk from the women in AI perspective sure, and in Ireland. I um, um, I think 
there are very less women right now in, in, in the workspace, in tech, in STEM in general. Um, and I think that is because they don't have role models from when they start schooling. And by the time they're in you know, high school, they've already made a decision for themselves. Um, I think this might extend to the greater you know, EMEA region. Um, but by the, by, the, by the time they're already you know, choosing their subjects, they have an opinion that you know, they might not want to go to STEM. Maths might be too difficult for them. You know, um, assumptions like these. So um, that's kind of a challenge. Well, uh, and going back to maybe India, a lot of people are there in, in STEM. You will find like so many women are there, um, but the same problem, D and I, the d diversity and inclusion problem goes when you climb, you know, higher up in your career. So, you know, two very contrasting um, subjects here. One where you need a lot of motivation to go take the STEM route. And I think the very few people who come, they, they've done like excellent jobs of climbing up the career. Whereas in you know, India, which is a developing country, right? There are many, many women who are there in STEM, who want to pursue STEM, their family wants them to pursue STEM, but they only go up to a certain level. So that's a DNI challenge and two different yeah. perspectives. Interesting. Can I just but so sure. can you elaborate and what do you mean when they go to a certain level? What level is so, that? Yeah, so they you know when they when they go up in more like seniority levels, right? So there are loads of responsibilities, but at the same time you have changes in your personal life. And that's where the the gap comes in. Expectations from society, Expectations your, from your society. gender role, you yeah. know what I mean? I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Teresa, um, any thoughts? Yeah, I would say that's still a problem in Germany as well. I think um, if you look at women in leadership, the percentages drop quite a lot, or if they are still rising, they are maybe for the wrong reasons. Um, and I think, um, I still remember when I was running Pi Ladies meetups in Hamburg in person, um, I still was getting sometimes, you know, the every now colleague asking, isn't this discrimination if I'm running meetups just for women? And, um, you know, it's all this, I think a lot of the diversity conversations have just not started. Sometimes it feels like compared to the United States. Um, and this is sometimes um, something that people working in diversity and inclusion in Europe, they just need to be prepared for all sorts of, um, a lot of like this, random statements, mm -hmm. questions, well meant, which are in the end, in any other country would be considered microaggressions, but here they are like well meant. Um, so yeah, I think it sometimes feels like we are <laughs> a little bit lagging behind and um, it's going to take a lot of, uh, it takes a lot more, I don't know, energy than it should. And um, so yeah. Uh, climbing up the career ladder is a lonely planet for mm -hmm. women in, in Germany at least. I don't know about the rest of Europe, but I expect um, at some point um, it becomes like that. And a lot of companies, uh, if you look at even the statistics on startups and um, who's like women founders and big companies, you know, they are in inherited and stuff like that. It doesn't really look good. Um, so. That's why I think there's a lot of effort, at least in Europe, to at least get more women through the door of, um, uh, yeah, in the diversity and inclusion, so in companies, in coding, in STEM, and uh, there's a lot of um, initiatives for getting people from school already, because, um, so I come from Romania, where, you know, kids don't grow up being told all the time that you can't do this, at least you can't study math because you're a girl and you're not going to be so good at it. But I've heard the stories way more often in Germany, right? And um, I think this is something that is currently being uh, fought, this one front, you know, to how to get kids in school to go to do STEM, you know, to kind of find that 
you know, math is cool and it's not hard at all and things like this. So I think, um, yeah, so it feels a little bit like the world wants to go into one direction and we have mm -hmm. to kind of try to keep the world not going in that bad direction that it's trying to go to at the moment. But, you know. Can, can, can I just add to that? Sure, can I just, As the single male panelist, <laughs> I just want to say that I acknowledge this. This is a problem, uh, but it's not a single problem for Uterisa or for Ireland. For example, it's actually a worldwide problem. Half of our world's population is women, and we are not using the power, the force. To, we, we are basically just walking on one feet, I mean, mm -hmm. one leg, when we have two, right? Um, unfortunately, um, I don't have the answer to this world problem of ours. Uh, I think I would like to use the magic wand from Naomi to actually solve this instead, if I <laughs> can. Um, Japan is as not really a great example of empowerment, uh, of giving opportunities to women. Uh, the latest study says that we are actually one of the lowest ranking in the disparity of, of, of the, the women, not only in STEM, mm -hmm. uh, but in politics, in senior positions, in leadership roles. Um, there are many reasons for this, which a uh, two-day panel will not even suffice, right? Um, like all of you already know, but it is a problem, and we need to do whatever we can, at least even small steps to actually solve this. Yeah, fundamentally, I mean, Marlon, do you want to go? What do you want to say, or maybe? Oh, I, you can go. Yeah. Go ahead. Fundamentally, there is a problem of having role models. I, in one of the recent conferences, I thought, you know, people say that um, women seek more mentorship, women seek guidance more than men, and I think that's because, you know, men have a lot of role models out there. And they can, you know, see guidance, mentorship, pretty much available. But when women don't see, you know, women or any other, you know, wh whatever you identify with, you know, they don't see somebody like them up on the stage, for them, it becomes like, can I do it? Or if they see that one person on the stage, you know, they tend to go to them and ask them, you know, can I do it? Can you help me get it? Whereas when you see like, oh, there are five women on the stage, oh, I could be one of them. There's very different, you know, mm -hmm. um, psychology that goes behind it. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, yeah, I think absolutely that is a layer that is there. I, I think that for women, definitely um, just just being underrepresented in general in um, in programming and computer science, when honestly we, sh we really shouldn't be. Like I, I just don't really understand. Like, yeah, it's just that I think is a really big barrier in terms of how we also approach um, diversity and inclusion from that inspiration perspective, or you know, thinking I can do something. I think also the layer when we even drop down, you know, one layer deeper as well, I think in a difference, for example, between um, like what we were saying, a different in perspective from uh, maybe the US or Europe and for example with Africa, it's just like, you know, sometimes the diversity that we have to take into consideration is like economic diversity and that's like probably for me, I would say in Africa, probably one of the number one thing that is like on my mind when I think about diversity and inclusion there. Say for example, right now we are going, we went into COVID and I, I mean here with your Python and PyCon US and all of these other conferences, it was like relatively seamless to be able to, um, to host a remote conference. Teresa is calling us in from, you know, calling here from Germany. But when we tried to organize PyCon Africa remotely, it was very difficult. It was extremely difficult. And, you know, prices of data, I feel like data is just very expensive for, and 
and it's not always like easy to stream things live and things like that. And so I just think in terms of like economics, that's like makes there be like an extra layer there. Mm -hmm. And so we are even thinking, okay, someone might even feel motivation, feel that they can do something, but do they actually have the resources to be able to do it? Mm -hmm. And so it's also thinking, okay, how do we make things accessible? How do we make programming accessible for people in places that don't have the same mm -hmm amount of money they can't spend a hundred and something dollars on a laptop or something like that. How do we get them Raspberry Pis or something that are like mm -hmm. uh, a lot more affordable to maybe get the basics of that down? And then how do we let them get to the next step of that, you know? So this is even before we're thinking about do they have the motivation, but if they get the motivation, what do they do then, you know? So I think those are also layers of diversity and inclusion that we have to keep in mind. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, those those are our questions. I think um, before we, we do anything else, um, I'd I'd like to offer each of you kind of a chance for a closing statement, call to action, whatever you want. Are are are, are you up for that or not? Yeah. Okay. Well, go go ahead, Marlene. I think you're you're, you're the next <laughs> in the rotation. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I just think. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone that came to this this session in general. Um, just, I think that people need to care about diversity and inclusion. I think it's awesome to care about the technical side of the language, but just the community aspect of it. There's like a human side to, throughout this conference, I've been hearing people saying that programmers are, are humans too. And I think there is a human side of, of Python. And so, I think it's awesome that people care about this issue. So I think if you have come to this panel session, if you are interested in um, the work the diversity and inclusion work group is doing or um, whatever it is, I would say number one, sign up to be a member of the PSF. You can do that at python.org. Um, and when the election comes, please vote for someone who's not from Europe or North America. That would be like, even though you're from Europe, please rebel from your own people. Um, so I would say that. I would also say, I would encourage you to, if you do get the chance as well, to go to conferences that are outside of Europe and North America if you can. I know that can be tricky as well. Um, but definitely encourage you to also kind of get out of your own perspective and try and travel to other spaces to be able to like understand um, some of the challenges. And I think that natural exchange is, is actually quite helpful for diversity and inclusion. So I think that would be my call to action. PyCon Ghana is coming up soon. The CFP I think might still be open. So if you would like to go to Ghana, feel free to apply to that. Yeah. Okay, call to action. Uh, register as a voting member. Uh, vote. Um, organize meetups, organize conferences. Um, I have found it personally very rewarding and very powerful to get involved with people which are different than me, uh, where I stay, the language that I usually speak from, and backgrounds. Um, whether it's cultural or social economic backgrounds, and they always come to a point where we share a common thing, a common value, and those are usually during the conferences such as this. Um, I also make it a point when I go to a conference to volunteer, like what I'm doing for Europython 2, and that automatically allows me access to the people there and also understand them better, which allows me to bring back things and we can learn from one another which will only make us better and stronger and go further together. And go scan the barcode down at the booth, right? Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> scan the barcode down at the booth uh, uh, and tell us who you are, where you're from, and uh, what language you speak and whether you understand what the PSF does. Yes, okay. Cool. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and of course, I'll pitch for uh, voting for PSF. I'm going to do next year. Yeah, next year, is it? That's awesome, yes. Yeah, 100%. Um, and then just 
on the, uh, just on the side of um, maybe last comments, um, I started with saying, like, for me, um, diversity and inclusion means breaking from the stereotypes. So um, my last words would be like, you know, if you, if you have a certain perspective in your mind already about someone, some community, some race, the different, you know, categories there are, think about that, that one single person, that individual, who that person is, and is it worth um, stereotyping that person and, and discriminating against that person? Is, that, is it worth it? Why would you do it? You know? So get over the stereotypes, celebrate individuality, and that's it, and vote for PSF. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Teresa. Yeah, so I have on the side of organizing things and events now that we're doing more and more conferences and meetups and small events, large events. I think the large events are starting to be better formed in the sense everybody who's organizing in large events now cares about diversity and inclusion and to kind of have diverse lineups, diverse attendance. But we should try not to forget the small events. So if you're organizing a meetup, try to get your community involved and try to get more local people also engaged and to present. Of course, it's always nice to bring a celebrity in, but try to figure out how do you get the local people who are rep representatives of your community engaged and you know to, to get, and also ask yourself, what do I have to do to get a diverse, lineup is my lineup are the people attending diverse enough and what am i doing wrong and reach out if you don't have the answers it's really important that we are having these conversations trying to really you know care about diversity care about inclusion and also all the intersections of diversity right and think about all the yeah what can you do in your community to have more of that because then everybody's gonna come i think i hope and have fun with Python. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I think we're really right about at the end of time. So uh, thanks to everyone who joined us, um, either you know in person or remote. We didn't forget about you, don't worry. Uh, and uh, again, I, these are good things to think about and these are some people that you might want to talk to uh, if you want to pursue this more. So yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, Naomi. Bye-bye. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So thank you for, um, well, thank you, Naomi, for yeah. moderating. Thank you, and Teresa's gone off now, so thank you. Yeah. I want to say thank you, Marlene, Iqbal, and Navanita. We do have like two minutes. Um, if, um, if people are, if you're okay for a Q and quick Q&A. Do okay. we have anything remote? No. Is there anyone want to, uh, you can approach the mic if you have a question, just up to here. So you have one or two questions, I think we should be okay. Hi there, uh, so first of all, thank you for organizing this panel and thanks to all panelists. It was a very interesting discussion, that's better. Um, so I was wondering uh, about the votes of the PSF. Uh, did you ever consider uh, to include quotas, like to make quotas for, diversity into the uh, vote for board of directors. Um, so that would be, yeah, I'm interested in that. Um, I know there's been discussion about having dedicated seats for regions. Um, and that has been something that has been discussed, but it's never actually been implemented or it hasn't been implemented yet. You know, that's something I think could be a really good solution, but it is something that would be quite a big change and needs consensus both from the board and then from the community. So if there's going to be a bylaw change, uh, there has to be a quorum in terms of every single, like in terms of um, a high enough number of the members voting for that bylaw change to happen. So it is a, that's a great question and it's a great idea that I think would work <laughs> to an extent. So hopefully it does happen in the future. Good luck with that. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> uh, I'm really sorry, we're just like time just got. So you can, um, um, they, they will be down in the PSF, you have a question for you, and you'll find Nabinita 
around as well. So I'm really sorry about that. Um, I'm also a member of PSF, and if you need to talk, I'm on a yellow shirt, so you definitely can find me um, if you have any questions. And go down to the PSF uh, table in the forum. And it's coffee break in a few minutes, so it's five past. So um, thank you again to the panel. Thank you to everyone here for um, joining us. It's been quite important, and I learned a lot. Um, and also, Naomi and myself are also on the PSF Grants Work Group as well. And uh, so, um, so we need more people to give more input. Uh, it would be nice as well, not just in Europe and North America. Definitely, I totally agree. Thank you again. I learned a lot. And thank you, everyone. Thank you.